um, thank you for inviting me here. Um, yes, as said, I will show you an algorithm for multi-stage stochastic um, integer programs, uh, which are based on proximity. Uh, this is, sorry, <laughs> this is joint work with uh, Fritz, Michal, um, Moritz, Ventin, and Robert. So first I will introduce you uh, the multi-stage or more specifically the two-stage stochastic integer program. Um, we consider an integer program to be minimizing over some objective function, a linear objective function. Um, we take the constraints to be quality constraints, I denote the matrix by M, and um, we ask for X to be larger than zero and integral. And <clears throat> more specifically, we are uh, looking at two-stage and multi-stage stochastic um, integer programs. Um, so two-stage stochastic integer programs are defined by, um, there is some global variables here x0, which can appear in all the constraints. Um, this is denoted by these submatrices a1 to an. And all the remaining variables are split into blocks, um, x1, x2, until xn. And in each of these blocks of variables, they only appear in a small number of constraints. So this is denoted here by these submatrices B1 to Bn. Um, and similar to uh, the split here, we're also gonna um, split the target vector into blocks. Um, for multi-stage stochastic LPs, uh, I will just give you a short idea on um, what this is, is that um, the, these blocks bi are not small blocks, but they recursively have um, the same structure again. So again, some a bit more global variables and the rest is split into local variables and so on. In this talk, I will mostly focus on the two-stage stochastic uh, integer program because the algorithm works pretty similar. The key ideas are the same, but it's a bit easier to understand because we don't have the recursive structure. So what do we actually want to show? Um, we know already that um, these programs are in fixed parameter tractable, uh, where the parameters are the sizes of the block. So R, S, and T, which is just how many rows and columns are in these small um, submatrices and the largest entry of the full matrix, denoted by the infinity norm of the matrix. And we just give a new approach on how we can solve them, so new ideas, and we can get for that a nearly linear time algorithm. So fixed parameter tractable, but nearly linear in the number of blocks. So um, I'll tell you a bit what was done until now, already said, um, both two-stage and multi-stage is a fixed parameter tractable. Uh, for two-stage, this was shown uh, by Himmelkorn and Schultz in 2003. And then a few years later, it was shown for multi-stage stochastic matrices by Aschenbrenner and Henneke. Um, I will not give you all the results that were um, done until then, but uh, since then, but just a few big key points. So the first strongly polynomial algorithm is due to Kotetsky, Levin, and On in 2018. And we now gave uh, this year, the end of last year to this year, um, the first strongly polynomial algorithm nearly linear in the number of blocks. <clears throat> um, since then, you see there is some space left. Uh, there is some other works done. Um, First of all, uh, there's a lower bound um, for two-stage stochastic uh, integer programs, which shows um, that our result is nearly tight. Um, and this result is due to uh, Klaus Janssen, Kim, and Alexandra. And another result, which is quite recent and will appear, I think, in SODA next year, 
um, is an improved uh, constant, um, improved dependency on the param uh, parameters um, for the multi-stage stochastic uh, integer program uh, by Kim and his student Janina Reuter. So now I will get into what we did. So this result here. Um, again, I just drew the picture of um, how our matrix looks like. Um, and I want to note that if we know um, what the optimal, if we know uh, for an optimal solution, what this x0, what the value of it is, then um, we can fix it and put it on the right hand side. And the problem um, decomposes into n small integer programs. These are small, we consider them constant dimension, so we can solve them in basically constant time. And the big question becomes, can we actually guess what this first variable, first block of variables is? Um, so the idea here is, um, that we relax uh, the integer program. So we relax the integrality constraint, look for an optimal fractional solution. And once we found that, um, we will get some result, the proximity result, which states that we can draw this box around um, our fractional solution um, with all the points which are smaller than some function in the parameters we're interested in. So this is the dimension of the small blocks and the largest entry of the matrix. And uh, the proximity result states that there is an optimal integer solution within this box. So here it said the optimal integer solution. It, there will be one in this box. There can be one outside, but we don't really care. And the algorithm is now just looking um, through all the possibilities we have um, for set zero. So for the first, for the global variables, there is only a constant number of entries in this block of, a, in this vector. So this gives us a constant number of possibilities um, we can use and the algorithm just goes through all of them, calculates uh, the optimal solution for them and then outputs the best among them, uh, all the possibilities. So the algorithm itself is fairly simple. Um, and the problem lies within showing that this box here exists. And this is what I think the remainder of my talk will be dedicated on. Um, so first we need to define some proximity. And um, normally this is done by taking an optimal fractional solution and saying there is an optimal integer solution close by, like we used in the algorithm. The problem is um, we are running on some problems if we take this definition. So um, we are defining proximity only based on the solution polytope, so independent on the objective function. We do not need the objective function in this definition. And the definition is as follows. So we have some fractional point x and um, some integer point set given, any point uh, that just need to be a fractional and integer solution. And what we say is that within this box, which is spanned between x and z, like this blue box, there is an integer solution y, which is close to x, where close just means uh, the infinity distance between y and x is smaller than the row. And um, this is exactly how we define the proximity of a polytope. So we say that we're taking the smallest constant such that for any choice of x and z, this y is existing. Um, now, to use this for our algorithm, we actually have to show that um, with this proximity, this is generalizing the proximity on optimal solutions. And that is this slide. So um, we're assuming that uh, our polytope has, has this general proximity where we can give a fractional solution and an integer solution and find a 
close integer solution within the box. So um, to prove that we have proximity of optimal solutions, which is take an optimal fractional solution X and an optimal integer solution Z, and then the general proximity gives us this Y. It's a close solution integer, um, but we do not know if it's optimal. And now if we are walking along this vector here, um, then the objective function can only decrease. It cannot increase because set is optimal among the integer solutions and y is an integer solution. So the objective function oh, only increase. Um, and w is defined to just be x where we subtracted this vector. So this is w as defined. And um, here again, we can show that W is actually a feasible solution of um, our program. So again, the objective function is only increasing along this vector. Meaning since it's increasing in one direction and in the other direction, it will have to stay constant. So Y is also has the same value than Z, meaning Y is also an optimal solution and it is in proximity of X by the general proximity. So now we can actually say our goal is to prove this general proximity for two-stage stoch two stochastic programs. Um, <clears throat> now, how do we do that? Um, the idea is uh, that we are splitting our full matrix into these small blocks of constraints. So for each like block of vari local variables, um, we're taking these small blocks of constraints, which I surrounded in red. <coughs> um, and uh, Reducing the proximity on these small um, small programs to then lift it up to the full program, um, and this is also why our version, uh, why the version was the optimal solution, uh, optimal uh, was the proximity depending on the optimal solutions didn't work. So what we do is uh, we take uh, some fractional solution X some integer solution set, and we're projecting uh, this X down onto these small blocks of variables. But this projected X down here, if even if X here is opti uh, optimal, that doesn't mean that this X zero X I is optimal in the small polytope. So that's why we needed a stronger notion of proximity. Um, so what we are doing now is we're trying to get our stronger notion up. Um, so we take X and we also take an integer solution and we define Y to be the closest integer solution within the box between X and Z. What do I mean with closest? That basically means in this green field here, there is no other integer solution. And the goal will be to show that um, Y will also be in proximity of X. So the distance between Y and X is at most some function in our parameters. And um, as I said, mentioned, uh, we're doing this by using the proximity on um, the small, um, on, on each of these slices of the, polytope or of the program. So we use the proximity here, we get some W and we will show that this first vector and the second vector both are short or bounded by the parameters. Um, so for the first vector, this is basically given by the proximity on the small polytope. So we have this these small blocks, they define a polytope. 
and uh, we have proximity on there. So since W is given by the proximity, we know that the distance between X and W can be at most rho, which is some constant. So the big question is, uh, what do we do with this second vector? And the first thing we notice is Y and W are both integer solutions of um, the small blocks of constraints. So the standard approach there is uh, to use Graeber basis and to decompose this vector into a set of Graeber bases. Now, um, for those who are not that familiar with Graeber elements, um, all you need to know is that A, you can actually do this at composition, and each of the elements is in the integer kernel, they're integer elements, and they're in the kernel of here, the small, um, the small block of matrices, and they are all of bounded lengths. So this is a bound um, given by our parameters. So we know that, yeah? Uh, just to clarify here, is uh, W10, that's the first block, right? Uh, W10 uh, is the first block. And so this is the global variable and WI is the local variable. So uh, currently so, when doing things in uh, the way you're doing them locally, you lose consistency on the first I block. lose consistency on these W. Uh, on, the, on those global variables. So this will be the, the main problem that um, we're losing consistency here. So for each block, uh, this W I zero, uh, that it can be different. So right. this is not actually an integer solution here. Good. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, what we want to do is um, we want to have some subset of describer elements or we want to show that there is not a lot of these Graeber elements. If you have done that, um, because they're bounded in the lengths, uh, that means that the second vector is bounded. So um, these two points are close to each other. Um, and what are you gonna do? Um, so the goal is to say that if there is a lot of these Graeber elements, we can actually find the subset um, such that they sum up and we don't have this problem of non-consistency. So the problem now is these points do not necessarily coincide on the first one. They're not the same on the first variable as was pointed out. Um, and the goal will be to have something that makes them coincide on these first set of variables. So to find this u, where u0 is now really the same for every block. The question is, how do we do that? Um, so for this, we uh, need a technical theorem. Uh, this was first uh, appeared in um, work of Klein, uh, Kim, in 2019. And we then uh, improved it a tiny bit um, to better fit our algorithm. So I will show you the our version. And it says that if you have n sets of vectors, I will not prove the theorem, I will just explain you what it does. Um, if you have n set, uh, sets of short vectors, so these are like these chains of vectors here, and we have n sets of them. So here it's a couple of them. Um, and we have, they have the property that they all sum up to nearly the same target. So they don't have to sum up to exactly the same target. They just have to be close to the target. Where close means that this distance is a constant. So for us, um, as long as this distance is constant, we can apply the theorem. And <clears throat> So we have these small vectors, and now the theorem says one of two possibilities appear. So one possibility is that this green point here, like the origin, will be close to um, the target or to the, the sum is really short. So either this is a short distance or 
A second possibility, we can rearrange each of these sets of vectors such that they meet somewhere in the middle. So they will meet after a fixed point. And now you can maybe see how we want to apply the theorem to our case. So what we would like to do is, I will show you a picture with letters. So this is our um, integer solution y, and this is our fractional solution x. And what we had in the picture before is, we had this uh, wi, for example, which is close to x. So this distance here was rho, um, close to x. And we had this graver decomposition. But we had this for the small blocks. Now, what I did here is I just projected each of these graver decomposition onto the first variables, onto these global variables. And since they are the same for each block, um, I can just layer them on top of each other and I get exactly the picture we used um, for the theorem before. And also here, because these were cryval elements, that means the vectors are still bounded and um, the summing to the closed target we have because of the proximity. So because this first distance was short. Now, um, the theorem says us that one of two things happen. Either um, x0 is close to y0, or more exactly, w is close to uh, y. But since they are close, that means x0 is close to y0. Or in the second case, uh, we can rearrange them. And we get some vector u, or some solution u. Um, this is a global variable u0. And I know that um, the projection of the graver basis of these vectors, they will end up in U. So what I can do is I can lift these elements, these little vectors again, to the solution um, on, the, on the small polytopes. And I will get... Um, a kernel element um, from x, y0, yi to some u0, ui. I don't really care what the local variables are um, for u, but there is a kernel element between those. And they will now coincide on the first variable, on these global variables, because on the global variables, um, the path looks exactly like in this picture. So they will be exactly at u. And this allows us to basically glue this solution together. So we just take the global variable u, u0, and then we add all the local variables. Um, so how does this look like in the first picture we drew? Um, so we have this x0, xi, we have y0, yi, and um, we had this like, short vector to w, and now we have this pass, uh, this decomposition of graver elements here. And what this looks like is uh, we're rearranging them such that they go through this point u0, ui, and we take the vector between this and this, which is a kernel element. So u0, ui is an integer solution of the small polytope. And by sticking it together, gluing it together, um, we get this u, which is now an integer solution of the full program. But if you remember, um, what we did is uh, we said is we defined y to be the closest integer solution. So we defined y that there is no integer solution in this green area, but you will lie in the green area by definition. So this is a contradiction because we shouldn't be able to find u. That means that in the theorem, the other possibility took part. The other possibility was 
um, that y0 is close to x0. So what we then do is we're able to lift this up to say that, okay, then y0, yi has to be close to x0, xi. So we, those two points are close. And then again, we're lifting this up because we're working with infinity norms. This is easy now. Um, we get that this y is close to x, which is exactly what we wanted. Um, here, close to basically means the distance is bounded by some function um, in our parameters, in the size of the small blocks and the largest entry in the matrix. Um, so as a a bit fast. <laughs> um, as a short recap, um, how this worked is um, we had this optimal fraction solution, um, which is found by some LP solver. Um, and now we know that this proximity bound holds. We know that there is an optimal integer solution in this. We're again only looking at the global variables and um, then testing all the possibilities for these global variables. And all that remains to do is uh, to say, what is the running time we get? <laughs> so um, for two stage integer programs, uh, we get some parameter dependence, which is doubly exponential. And it is still nearly linear in the number of blocks. This nearly linear, nearly linear comes from we actually have to solve the linear program, and we cannot do that in linear time. So once we have x given, this gives us a linear possibility, but this is not possible. And to go back to multi-stage stochastic, um, here, we also get this nearly linear running time, um, but the dependence on the, um, on the parameters is much worse, um, and it heavily depends on this depth of n. Depth of m is intuitively this recursion depth we have. So yes, that was it for me. Thank you very much.